Good day, my name is Scott Graham, and I'm happy to be here today on behalf of myself and my co-authors, Zoltan Moydik, Joshua Barber, and Justin Rousseau. We are glad to be here digitally to talk to you about associations between aggregate NLP extracted conflicts of interest and adverse events by drug product. To begin with, here's what we know about conflicts of interest in industry funding. The available literature indicates that industry-funded trials are up to 5.4 times more likely to return positive results. Trials with conflicts of interest are up to 8.4 times more likely to return positive results. And trials with industry funding or COI may understate harms or adverse events. The association between industry funding or COI and results favorable to industry has been confirmed in a wide range of clinical areas and even in several studies that cross clinical subspecialties. Compelling data about the potential harms of COI on biomedical research date back to at least 2005, and the overall picture of the effects of industry funding in COI are generally supported by a 2017 Cochrane Systematic Review of 75 studies in this area. However, while that review generally confirms these findings, the authors note that the overall quality of evidence is moderate to weak. One issue that we, the authors of this presentation, identify with much of the available research on the effects of COI on clinical research stems from the foundational research design. For most research on COI, the basic unit of analysis is either the clinical trial or published journal article. Researchers then extract data on industry funding or conflicts of interest and compare those data to the study outcomes. This is an important and informative approach to the study of COI and industry funding, but we argue that it is insufficient by itself. Specifically, our concern is that the research design does not effectively parallel the actual practice of clinical science. Science is a team sport. When science is at its best, results from prior studies are meaningfully incorporated into future studies. This means that there's a real risk of aggregate effects from the kinds of bias induced by industry funding and conflicts of interest. A given study may have no COI, yet it still may be substantially indebted to biased outcomes from previous research. The current state of the science in any given area is in large part the sum of the available findings in a given research area. Citation networks like this one are a good way to model the state of an individual science and related potential for the aggregation of biased outcomes. The figure on screen is the co-citation network for research on rare diseases and orphan drugs between 2000 and 2014. As you can see, certain scientific areas become visible as aggregations of the collected literature. In this diagram, for example, there are clearly identifiable subnetworks for male breast cancer or hereditary angioedema. While our study does not use a co-citation network approach, it is a good way to visualize the overall research design. Specifically, our goal was to identify the current state of the science for a number of major drug products and to extract information on aggregate COI. That is, the collected conflicts of interest for all the articles in the research area, and then to compare those aggregate COI rates to data on drug safety. Accomplishing this requires the integration of information from several major databases. Specifically, we collected the top 300 drugs list from ClinCalc. ClinCalc aggregates the results of the annual Medical Expenditure Panel Survey of U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. This broad survey of the U.S. general public solicits, among other things, information on drugs currently prescribed. These data provide a snapshot into the usage rates for different drug products, and ClinCalc identifies the top 300 each year from these results. Using the top 300 drugs list as a guide, we extracted executed queries of PubMed and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Adverse Event Reporting System, or FAERS, these queries allowed us to collect the most relevant 10,000 articles for each of the available drug products and associated adverse event data as indexed with FAERS. Collecting and aggregating the data from FAERS was quite easy. However, collecting the conflicts of interest information in the aggregate was quite a bit more challenging. COI data is generally not stored in easy to access databases with clearly labeled rows and columns. Rather, it exists in natural language in the footers of published articles. 
Since 2016, PubMed has also included these footers in their XML schema for participating journals. A significant challenge comes from the fact that not only are these COI statements semi-structured at best, and different journals have different style guidelines that may render the exact same COI differently. For example, you might see the same COI involving the same author and the same funder written out in the following different ways. Charles Winchester holds stock in GlaxoSmithKline. C. Winchester has equity interests in GSK, C. W. holds equity shares in Glasgow, and so on, and so on, and so on. While it's easy for human readers to parse discrete entities, funders, and funding recipients, as well as relationship types, modes of funding distribution, it's not quite so easy to do this work at scale and to aggregate the results. In order to tackle these problems, we developed a hybrid machine learning enhanced metadata assisted approach to COI statement parsing. Uh, specifically, the parser uses a custom trained named entity recognition model to identify pharmaceuticals companies and combines that data with author permutations drawn from PubMed article metadata. When company author pairings are identified, the parser then checks a relationship type dictionary to classify the specific COI, and we use the data to aggregate the results for entire scientific areas rather than on an article by article basis. I'm not going to unpack all the details today, but I will highlight a couple of key areas. First, the NER based source tagging. When it comes to identifying authors, we had a real leg up with the PubMed metadata. However, there's no discrete list of all the possible funding sources. We could get a list of companies with currently approved FDA products, but that will never account for all the startups out there. Our approach, therefore, started with named entity recognitions tools built into the Spacey NLP library. We used NER data from the large pre-tamed English web text model and applied it to a small sample of COI disclosure statements. After hand correcting those statements, we got a 25% improvement in named entity recognition. Part of the trick here involves getting Spacey to recognize when initials are people and when they are organizations. In this case, MIM and JKB are people while LLC is part of an organizational name. The other part I'll mention briefly here is the relationship dictionary. As the, the examples on the slides indicate, there are a lot of different mechanisms by which money can change hands in biomedical research. Employment, stock ownership, travel funds, honoraria, research grants. We wanted to start to differentiate between different types of conflicts of interest to see if different modes of payment might impact biomedical research differently. Given the wide number of different types, we decided to cluster them based loosely on categories provided by the International Council of Medical Journal Editors. We used a fairly simple regular expressions or regex dictionary to identify COI types. And to assess the final reliability of our developed parser, we hand-coded a random sample of 1,000 COI statements. We then assessed human parser agreement with intra-class correlation coefficient and received respectable reliability scores ranging from 0.56 for type 1 COIs to 0.773 for type 2 COIs. There are of course competing standards for qualitative interpretation of ICC scores, but most would rate these scores as moderate to good. At the end of the day, the parse text must be restructured into relational database tables so the COI can be analyzed in the aggregate. Of course, rather than using individual studies or individual adverse events as unit of analysis, all collected data were aggregated by drug product prior to analysis. So for example, the collected research on clindamycin had 28 type 1 COI, 6 type 2 COI, and 7 type 3 COI. There were 1,834 adverse events for clindamycin, 952 tagged as serious, 418 involving hospitalizations, and 46 that led to deaths. For fluoxetine, there were 367 type 1 COI, 210 type 2 COI, and 11 type 3 COI. FAIRS reported 4,605 adverse events, 3,360 serious, 1,293 hospitalizations, and 442 deaths. 
Overall, the average product had an average of 39.07 type 1 COI, 25.39 type 2 COI, and 10.01 type 3 COI. The total number of adverse events reports ranged from 2 to 65,591, with an average of 3,878.1. Given the overdispersion in the data, a quasi-Poisson regression model was used for all analyses. Type 1 COI are associated with a 1.1 to 1.8% increase of adverse events, serious events, hospitalizations, and deaths. Type 2 COI are associated with a 1.7 to 2% decrease in adverse events across severity levels. Type 3 COI are associated with an approximately 1% increase in adverse events, serious events, and hospitalizations, but have no significant association with adverse events resulting in death. While a 1 to 2% incident response ratio appears modest on its face, for a typical product, a single new type 1 COI or type 3 COI would associate with 38 new reports, 24 new serious events reports, 10 hospitalizations. If conflicts by type were to increase by a standard deviation, 125 for type 1, uh, 20 for type 3, we would expect to see 4,847 more adverse event reports, 74 new deaths for type 1 conflicts, 775 new reports for type 3 conflicts. Interestingly, grants and contracts, or type 2 COI, were associated with a reduction in adverse event rates across severity levels. This finding suggests that there may be an important difference between personal and institutional conflicts of interest. Type 1 and Type 3 COI all involve direct disbursement to authors, speaking fees, travel money, employment, stock options. However, Type 2 COI are typically grants paid to universities, research hospitals, and institutions provide significant internal oversight of research ethics and quality. Additionally, many Type 2 COIs come from federal funding agencies or nonprofit organizations. Subsequent research should evaluate the funding source if the funding source impacts associations demonstrated in this study. While these findings offer a promising new direction for COI research at scale, additional studies are warranted to support effective and appropriate COI policies. Available data on COI are limited by the lack of uniform reporting standards across journals, incomplete participation in PubMed's COI reporting scheme, Additionally, coordinated research efforts in these areas are challenged by the lack of a commonly accepted controlled vocabulary or ontology for conflicts of interest. Confirmatory research in this area should enhance the parsing algorithms identifying different categories of COI, expand data collection beyond PubMed. Future work might also consider defining increasingly granular approaches to categorizing COI. However, if these data are borne out in subsequent research, they would suggest that COI policies should be modified to address COI types of greatest risk to patients and support those that enhance patient safety. Empowering researchers, data scientists, and policymakers with evidence-based approaches for the management of research funding and COI is a critically important part of safeguarding both the integrity of biomedical research and patient health. Specifically, the results here add to growing evidence base that indicates common intuitions about which types of COI carry which risks of bias may not be accurate. COI policies need to be grounded in stronger evidence about the risks associated with specific types of COI. Additionally, the results of this study suggest that a new intellectual framework is required for research into COI, one that is grounded in an aggregate COI within clinical areas and not individual studies or individual authors. In addition to the specific findings for COI risks and related policies, this paper also uh, contributes to efforts to integrate system science and informatics methods into the study of health policy. In recent years, AI and informatics have been leveraged to positively contribute to health and medicine in clinical and administrative contexts. These same technologies have the potential to productively advance research in health policy and to provide new evidence-based foundations for health policy decision-making. 
This paper offers one model for research in this area. Future health policy informatics projects might investigate associations with various policy initiatives and patient safety or other outcomes of interest. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to our sponsors. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or need additional information.